I've been playing with a local Red Bull. <laughs> Lemon juice something. Hey, people on the live stream, we'll just be starting in a couple of minutes. who is our host, yep. she'll open um, and then she'll throw to me and I'll actually sort of stick in. Yeah, of course. Right, that's good. You can hear the sound all right? Awesome. I don't know if you need to be my volume checker because ah, it's, it's going. this mic is listening to me. So we're talking about the letters or something. Oh. <laughs> you just don't know if I'm mumbling. All right. <laughs> Hey everyone, how's it going today? Hope we're all excited about today's product tank. Thank you all for joining us here for uh, the Auckland product tank. We're really pleased to host this here at PushPay. We're really supportive of the wonderful and engaged product community that we have here. Um, I'm just here for housekeeping, so just wanted to let you know that this is a secure area. You'll see that there are some uh, whiteboards up that just say this way, if you could please stay within the bounds of this area. Bathrooms are by the elevators, so men's on this side. Women, you'll have to go around the kitchen and off towards the elevators that way. Um, in the event of a fire, please use the, the stairs. <laughs> Uh, just go all the way down to the third floor. Um, if you exit out, um, the meeting area, I think with all the construction, is just across the road. Um, so to the left and across the road. Um, what else? Um, we're also hiring for a lead <laughs> product <laughs> product designer. Um, so if you know anybody, we would be grateful for you, for you to refer them. Um, with f further ado, I'm going to pass over to Anthony, who's going to uh, talk a little bit about our product tank tonight. Thanks, Audrey. So, so that's the benefit that you get of hosting a product tank event. You get you get to talk about who you're hiring. So, you know, just just for, for that future reference, and you know, if you've got somewhere where you want to host, just come and have a chat with myself or Audrey or one of my other organisers here tonight. Um, in case you're wondering why I'm why I'm holding this, and uh, there's no sound coming out of the PA, that's because we're streaming today. Um, so we're streaming live to. Uh, Product Tank Wellington. Unfortunately, Martin was only able to make it to Auckland on this trip, so we're bringing in the Wellington uh, crew. So, hi, Wellington. Everybody say hi, Wellington. Hi, Wellington. All right. Um, so, anyway, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, as I said, we are streaming this one live. We're also going to be taking questions via Slido. Um, that's so that the team Wellington can also um, submit questions and everybody gets a fair chance to, to bring some questions into Martin. So, we won't be taking, well, we, we may take a few questions from the floor at the end, but Primarily, we want to take um, questions via Slido. So if you've got a phone in your hand, uh, make sure it's on silent. Um, but then also go to sli.do and put in code hash L447. So that's the code that's up on the board over there. And that you can ask questions um, via that. Um, and same goes for you, the team in, in Wellington, hash L447. Everybody got that? Good. Excellent. All right. So... Um, Product Tank, um, under that brand, we've been going for around about two years in Auckland. Um, the, the meetup itself has been going, actually, we'll, be, we'll turn five in February next year. Watch out for an, an awesome event around that. Um, but about two years ago, we decided to join up with the with the Product Tank brand, and that connects us to Mind the Product. So Mind the Product are the global organisation who um, basically help us run the Product Tank brand around the world. And we've been very, very privileged to connect with the international team behind that who runs that. It's been able to, it's enabled us to get some really amazing international connections to bring people down here to the end of the earth. You know, we are, you know, nobody really passes through Auckland. So Mind the Product have been fantastic with connecting us with international speakers when they come to New Zealand. Um, and we've had a few good ones. Today, we are extremely privileged to have Martin Erickson. Now, Martin actually set up Product Tank um, how many years ago, Martin? 2010. 2010, so it's been going a while now, and there are 
a min mini product tanks around the world. I feel like I should know that number off the top of my head. Every time we write it down, it changes, so <laughs> that's fine. It's 195 cities around the world. So 195 cities running product tank around the world. So um, the one thing I would encourage um, everybody here is that I know, you know, as Kiwis, as working for Kiwi companies who often have overseas links, um, there are product tanks in almost all of the cities that you will travel to for your, you know, for business or for holiday. Connect via the Mind the Product Slack group with the product tanks in those areas. I myself have had some fantastic conversations with product tanks in different parts of the world, in San Francisco and Hong Kong. Um, you know, it's great to connect with your peers and find out what's going on over there. And Mind the Product just provide that connection for us, which you know, being down here at the end of the year, we really, really appreciate. Um, so anyway, without further ado, I will pass over to Martin, who will speak to us tonight. And I'm really looking forward to this because um, yeah, we have to make decisions all the time. So how can we do it better? Thanks very much, Martin. Thank you. Okay, how do we do that again? No, that didn't work. All right. All right, thank you very much for that very warm welcome. Uh, I'm super excited to be here in Auckland uh, and in New Zealand for the first time, and I am very sorry that I couldn't make it down to Wellington, but uh, uh, it's a good excuse to have to come back some other time. So, as Anthony said, uh, I've been a product manager for over 25 years, building stuff since the mid-90s, gone through at least one dot-com crash, uh, and maybe another one coming soon, who knows. Uh, as we said, we have Product Tank, which I founded in London, is now in 195 cities around the world. By the end of this talk, it's probably going to have gone up from that. Uh, and it's the reason that it's so exciting to come out to places like Auckland is, and find the community here is when I started that, it was as a VP product at a startup, which those of you in the role know can be a little bit lonely. All the engineers are ganging up on you and all the designers make fun of your sketches. <laughs> and so I wanted to find other product people to, to talk to and learn from and share my lessons with. And that very first meetup, we had 20 of keep going. We're already experiencing technical difficulties. <laughs> uh, and out of Product Tank, we grew Mind the Products, which is a conference in London, San Francisco, and now Singapore. Uh, and it's just been an amazing way to kind of see that this community is all over the world. And fundamentally, that we all share the same challenge. So almost every one of those conversations that I have with product people, this is the kind of number one question. How do we know that we're building the right thing? How do we know that this is the right way to go? And it really does come down to decisions. As you know, in your jobs, every single day, you're making decisions from the tiny little decisions about you know, what color something should be, where do we want to put on the page, to big, meaty decisions around strategy and direction and what you need to be doing. And that can get really exhausting. I think when we run the conference, um, we realize that we just make so many decisions every single day running up to the conference that at the end of the day, you kind of come home and you can't even decide what to make for dinner because your brain is just fried. So decision fatigue is definitely a thing. And I think that's why it's so important to figure out better frameworks to make better decisions. And the interesting thing is to just look at the etymology of the word. So decisions come from the Latin decidere, which literally means to cut off. And it really, the importance of that is that you're deciding not to do something just as much as you're deciding to do something. And so we come up with these questions every single day, right? These decisions that we have to make. What do we want to build? How do we want to build that? And why are we doing it? And so I've come up with this framework that seems to help teams that I advise to try and connect all those dots. And the individual elements in here aren't brand new. Like we've talked about some of these in the past, but I think being able to connect them all the way through is what really helps make people make better decisions. Of course, you all hopefully have a strong vision or mission statement. You kind of know the purpose of the company. You know where you're going, why you exist, and what the problem is that you're trying to solve for your customers. A strategy of how you're actually going to achieve that. And then objectives, ethics, themes, whatever you call that next layer down of trying to figure out how you're going to start achieving that strategy. And all underpinned by design principles or product principles, design values, whatever you want to call them kind of reflecting the vision down into the, those daily decisions. And the interesting thing, of course, is every step of the way, you're deciding what not to do. So this is kind of what I want to talk about today and, and how to start thinking about implementing it and making sure that you are actually covering all of those steps. Yep. 
the really interesting thing here is to start thinking about as you go down the stack from vision down to the kind of day-to-day -day decisions, you're asking how. So from your vision, how are you going to achieve that? Well, here's our strategy that wants us to achieve that vision. How are you going to achieve that strategy? Oh, well, here's the objectives that we're setting or the, the goals that we have. How are you going to achieve that? Well, here's the themes or the epics or stories that you want to build all the way down. And that's why principles are kind of at the bottom because they're really telling you how to make those every day-to-day -day decision when you're building an epic or building a story. But if you're not a product leader, if you're not the founder of a company and not the CEO, it's also interesting to see that you have to ask why all the way up, right? You probably do that a lot already. Why are we doing this? Why is this so important? Why are you prioritizing this over all the things that we just talked to the customers about? <laughs> but I think it's really important to keep asking those questions so that you get a good conversation about this in your company, about strategy and about vision. It's also really important to note that there's this concept of kind of decisionception, that this happens at every layer of the business, right? So there's a company vision that boils down to an objective for a team, then there's a, you know, the team should ideally have a vision and a strategy of how they're gonna achieve that vision down to almost the individual level, right? So this happens at every level in the company. If you're a multi-product multi portfolio company, you have this for every single product in that portfolio and one for the overall company. And again, it's just a great way of continuously asking how all the way down and kind of understanding why you're building anything as you go up. So starting at the top, that why, I feel is so incredibly important. We do talk a fair amount about this, I think, in our industry, but I don't feel like we nail it uh, and I have a clear enough idea of why we do what we do, <laughs> including organizing microphones. <laughs> So you've probably all seen a template like this, right? To be the leading best provider slash supplier of customer focus slash market driven solutions slash product services, number one in the world. <laughs> There's way too many visions like this and these cookie cutter templates <laughs> just don't work, right? They don't mean anything. They're not really positioning you. They are not uh, help you understand why you're doing what you're doing. And the reason a strong vision is so important is studies have shown that kind of 75% of venture-backed startups, and the number one reason they report um, in a big study that the Harvard Business School did was a lack of focus. And if you don't know what you're focusing on, if you don't know why you're doing what you're doing, it is way too easy to just get pulled in any uh, of a million directions by your customers, especially in enterprise, and kind of get sidetracked from what your mission was in the beginning. <coughs> It's also important because to me at least, and I hope for you, vision is a really strong motivator. In Daniel Pink's book, The Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us, he kind of found that you know, motivating employees beyond basic tasks is all about autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And the desire to do something that has meaning and is important is what drives that purpose. And the interesting thing here is it doesn't have to be you know, save the world, it doesn't have to be a gigantic purpose it doesn't have to be the Silicon Valley, like we're gonna make the world a better place mantra. Uh, it can just be solving a problem for a customer. It can just be knowing how what you're doing is making a customer's life a little bit better, a little bit cheaper, a little bit easier. That's a great purpose. That's something people can get behind and get excited about. Vision's also incredibly important for alignment. This is one of my favorite kind of two by twos. It's by Henrik Nieberg, who's an organizational coach at Spotify originally. Uh, he kind of designed what has become known as the Spotify model, even though he'll be the first person to say that it was never meant to be a model and Spotify doesn't actually work that way anymore. Um, but he has a, a lot of great thinking around this where if you're at the bottom left uh, and low alignment, low autonomy, it's kind of a very micromanaging organization. It's an indifferent culture. If you instead move up the alignment scale, it's very authoritative, very conformist. You're kind of just doing what the boss tells you to do. If you're instead moving up the autonomy scale, it's very <coughs> entrepreneurial, very chaotic, a lot like a lot of startups. You kind of hope somebody's actually working. All the consultants in the room know you want to be in the top right corner of any two by two. High alignment and high autonomy means that you can have an innovative organization, a collaborative culture, and the leadership is still there to kind of let tell you what the goal is, but it's up to the team to figure out how to get there. So how do you actually start thinking about writing a good vision? For me, it's incredibly important that it's actually customer centric. It's not about, we wanna be the biggest and best company, we wanna be a billion dollar this. It's about solving a customer problem. It has to be concise and clear so that everyone in the company can understand it. 
It has to set an audacious goal. This is almost an unachievable goal. You might never get there, but that's a good thing for the company to keep striving towards. And it kind of therefore it needs to avoid detail, it needs to stop talking about what you're going to build or how you're going to do it or what market you're going to go into, because that's not really your vision. Bad visions, on the other hand, are company centric, right? You've probably seen a lot of these, like we're going to be the biggest and best, we're going to hit a billion dollars or something like that. It's all about the company, all about their goals, and has nothing to do with the customer. It doesn't tackle challenges. I think this is one of the key things of really understanding that you know your vision is going to be big and audacious, but you have to kind of acknowledge that that is a big and audacious thing. It's going to be a challenging thing to get there. If you kind of gloss over that, um, it's not going to end well. They also mistake goals for strategies. So I think a lot of the times you probably see visions that have kind of very goal-driven things around, again, that billion-dollar example, or we're going to be the biggest in Asia or something like that. But it's much more about a goal or an objective and not a vision. Examples, just to kind of make this more concrete, IKEA's uh, vision is to create a better everyday life for many people. Again, big audacious goal. You can see how everything that they do around furniture, connected devices, IoT, everything plays into that vision. Nike's is bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world, and they actually have the asterisk. If you have a body, you are an athlete. So again, very audacious, very big, but also very kind of all-encompassing and very welcoming. Microsoft's used to be, not anymore, a computer on every desk and in every home. Big audacious goal, it took them 30 years to do it, and now they've kind of switched to another mission. Kickstarters has been to help bring creative projects to life. Mind the Products, for example, is to make product people more successful by coming together to further our craft, because we believe that that's what this is all about. Oxfam, which is a charity in the UK, has a world without poverty. I think everyone can agree that that's a vision or a mission we could get behind and really want to work on. Um, but it's also audacious. They know they're not going to get there. But it is something that they can have as a purpose for their whole company. So now that we've kind of figured out why we're doing what we're doing, we have a vision set, it's really important to take that next step. And I think this is what's fallen out of kind of fashion to an extent, of really focusing between on strategy. And so when I go out and talk to companies, there's a huge disconnect between long term and short term high level and detail, and I see a lot of companies that have a great vision but no execution, or the other way around, no vision but great execution, and it's kind of <laughs> what's, what's going on there, right? But that also means that they're executing in all sorts of different directions, they're not executing towards one common goal. And that missing step really is strategy, and I think you know anyone who's gone to business school or done an MBA knows strategy, this is an exciting stuff. We talked a lot more about it in the 80s and 90s. We kind of stopped talking about it for a while. I don't know why. I think it's because it's hard to do. It's hard to write really good strategy. And it's much more exciting to try to set that big vision statement and then kind of go straight into how are we going to build the thing. But strategy is really what connects the dots. I always want to quote Sun Tzu in a talk, right? Um, Tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. So you really do need strategy to know what you're going to build <coughs> and where you're going to go. And there's a million different methods for this, right? There's no prescriptive thing here. You do a quick Google and you get like a dozen of these things. Um, the classic SWOT analysis, obviously strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats is where they all come from. And really it's about understanding your current situation. Where are you now? What is your company doing? What are you good at? What are you not good at? What is that outcome, that mission or vision that you're aiming for? What are the opportunities that you can leverage whether it's new technologies or new markets or something that you're class leading in, what are the things that you can actually leverage? And then what are the possible actions that you can start taking to get there? I don't think we have enough of these conversations at the company level or at the product level. And I think that's where a lot of teams start falling short. So to drill down a little bit, it's really thinking about, again, your customers, your market, your context, what's kind of working today, what's not working, what are the challenges? Like, what's competition coming in? Behavior changing? Are those kind of driving big shifts in your usage and your customer base? And again, opportunities, right? New markets, new technologies, new trends. If you understood the power of mobile in about 2000 and started building e-commerce for mobile, you were kind of building into that trend and really taking opportunity, taking that opportunity and leveraging it to build a great business, right? And then what are the actions we can take, right? Marty Kagan, who you all hopefully know, 
defines our job as discovering that which is valuable, usable, and feasible. And that's really that next step down of figuring out what are the things that we can build to actually start moving towards that strategic objective to start leveraging those opportunities. And I really want to drill in on valuable. I think a lot of the time when you hear that, you think, oh, it's all about making money, right? It's all about the, com the company bottom line. It's all about margin enhancing ways. But really, it's making sure that you're doing both. Because if you're not delivering value for your customer, of course, you're ultimately not going to be delivering value for the company either. So good strategy um, is based on your current reality. It tackles those challenges head on and says, this is really hard. Like, this is, this is going to be a challenge for us. We have a competitor coming into this space. But we're going to leverage our strength and our position to outmaneuver them or do something different that we believe is going to win in the market. It outlines that value chain, so really understands how are you driving value for your customer? Are you making things easier, cheaper, simpler? Um, t you know, whatever it is that you're doing, you need to understand how valuable that is to your customer in order to derive that value back to your company. It includes coherent actions that you can take as that next step to understand this is where we're going to go. We're going to go into this market. We're going to do that thing. And it, again, emphasizes focus over compromise. Bad strategies instead, I'm sure you've seen a lot of these, full of meaningless fluff about big goals, um, not really taking on challenges, not really acknowledging that there are difficult situations in your market, competitors moving in on you. Um, it, again, goes down too far and mistakes goals for strategy. So go build this thing, go build an output. And it sets bad strategic objectives so that you don't really know how you're going to achieve the strategy or the vision. One way to think about it is really a series of product market fits, right? We talk a lot about product market fit for an individual product or for a startup, but it's important to think, realize that how whether, however you map out your product, whether it's you know this kind of idea, geographies, um, different channels that you might go to market, different steps of the value chain, you can start mapping out kind of where you are currently and where you want to go next. And it's really important to understand like those adjacencies are much more much easier for you to do. So for example, here in New Zealand, on the geography scale, you might start with you know, local to New Zealand, then you might go to Australia, Australasia next and go to kind of um, Southeast Asia, US, you know, whatever that region is, it helps you understand like, what are the steps you need to take to do that? How does that tie back to your strategy? And also makes you focused on measuring product market fit for that adjacent step. So, Hopefully you all know that that first product market fit is not where it ends, right? You have to kind of do that every single time. You go into a new geography every time you launch into a new customer segment. And it's so important to focus in on really getting the product market fit in that area before you take on the next challenge. At the end of the day, I think why this is so hard is that it's still an art as much as a science. It's just like a scientific hypothesis where we're making an inductive leap and they have to be subjected to the same kind of logical tests and empirical tests before it can be validated. But we're actually really good at this as product people. We're really good at coming up with hypotheses. We're really good at figuring out how to validate those hypotheses. So we just need to do it at that next level up. What it comes down to is strategies about making tough choices, providing focus for the organization, again, outlining the actions needed to achieve that vision and ultimately an exercise in problem solving, which again, product people are fantastic at. So let's just take that up a notch and look at a level higher. Once you've figured out kind of your vision and mission, you figured out your strategy, I kind of skip ahead a little bit to what I, what I talk about is how. What are the principles by which you're going to build the product that you want to build? Now, this can be called design values, product principles. I don't really mind what you call them. But they're really, really good and powerful heuristics for making those day-to-day -day decisions that you make as a team or as a product manager. Uh, as Roy Disney said, uh, it's not hard to make decisions when you actually know what your values are. So I'm going to dig into this a little bit. So it's really a framework for decision making. It should help you with all those tiny decisions that you and your team make every single day. And they're specific and actionable rules that evolve slowly and they reflect your vision. I'll give you some examples, I think, that might help kind of clarify this. So Google has one of their principles to focus on the user and all else will follow. So in any conversation that they have about you know, a user experience issue on the search result page versus an ad buy, the user's going to win. 
and it's a really easy heuristic for them every time they get into that conversation to like, hang on, actually one of our values says focus on the user, so we're going to do that first. And they know that if they bring the users, the advertisers have to follow anyway. Klarna, which is a, an e-commerce payment tool in Sweden, says, uh, has one about conversion trumping profitability optimization. So for them and their clients, it's all about conversion. It's at this point not about optimizing profitability. And again, when you get down into the weeds of those little decisions that we make in product, you come up against these kind of trade-offs all the time, like should we do this or that? But they have it as a principle, bottom line across the company, so you, you just can automatically make that decision. It's almost, doesn't take any effort, doesn't cause confusion, doesn't cause any escalation points, you don't have to do a meeting, you just make the decision, right? Uh, I worked at Monster for many years, the job board, and they also had a similar rule to Google's that job seekers came first and returned. And again, the whole principle was building the best possible experience for a job seeker, because if you get all the job seekers coming to the site to search for jobs, register CVs, the recruiters are going to follow. They have to, because that's where that audience is. And it really did help us in those day-to-day -day decisions whenever we had a trade-off point between a job seeker experience and a recruiter experience, because the job seeker always came first. One way to start thinking about this is there's a concept called even overstatements. And they're a fantastic tool to start thinking about how to make these trade-offs and how to really clarify them for your company and for your team. So get specific about those trade-offs. Some, some examples like conversion even over revenue. Doesn't mean a revenue isn't important, but conversion trumps it. User growth even over revenue. Mobile experience even over desktop. Whatever those tools and decisions are in your team, having them almost up on a wall helps you make those decisions every single day. Good principles help make those decisions easy. They describe how you actually want to build a product. What are those little trade-offs you want to make every single day? They're specific to your company. You can't copy-paste these from somebody else. They're easy. They should evolve slowly over time. And it's all about this concept of decision-making velocity, right? It's really helping our teams and helping us be able to make these decisions much, much faster without having to call meetings, without having to escalate it to our boss, because we know that what these principles say, and we can just execute based on that. So we set all that up. We have a strategy. We have a vision. We know what our principles are. What comes next? Whatever you want to call these, I know every company has different namings, whether it's themes, objectives, OKRs. It's really about that next step down from the strategy. What are the actual actions that you're going to take to achieve the strategy? And this is where I believe a lot in autonomous teams, and I feel it's our job as leaders and even as product managers to declare the intent but give autonomy to the team. So it's really about socializing that vision, getting it spread out around the company, sharing it with everybody, making sure they understand it, making sure it's clear repeating it constantly, because you can never repeat these things enough, and then let them work out how they can help achieve it in their area. The old model of kind of setting company goals was very top-down, right? Some companies still do this, um, which is where you set a company goal, the company that goes and tells each team, this is what you need to contribute towards our company goal, the team goes and tells each individual, this is what you have to contribute. And at the end of that planning quarter or year, whatever planning period you're trying to do, you realize you've missed all your targets. Because the team wasn't involved in that conversation. And the new model is really about commitment. And it's about declaring that intent still from the company. So it's all about technology. It's being clear about why you're doing these things. Setting the company goals, but then kind of letting each team go and figure out how are they going to contribute to those goals? What is it that they can do in their area? If they're in the checkout team, is it a conversion thing? Is it a, uh, you know, a basket value thing? Whatever it is that they can contribute within their area to those company goals. And the interesting thing with that is you pretty quickly get back, and before the planning period's even started, <coughs> you can find those gaps, right? And maybe team B here needs a bit of help. Maybe you need to go in and coach them and help them figure out why they can't commit more work. Or maybe you need to look at other options to achieve that business goal up a new team, look at new areas, look at new segments, but at least you know in advance. And the team's also involved in making those decisions, so they own the decision in a different way. 
OKRs, hopefully most of you are using, uh, came out of Intel and Google mainly. Um, it's all about setting those objectives, making sure that they're very qualitative and inspirational, uh, time-bound and actionable, and then obviously the key results are there about quantifying the objective so you know whether you've achieved it or not. Keeping the results as low as possible is always a good idea. I think I've seen some people who have, uh, I kid you not, an OKR spreadsheet where they had two objectives and 50 key results for each of those each of those objectives. And you're just measuring everything for the sake of measuring everything. But it also means that you're not having that conversation about what are the results that actually matter to that objective. Is it about conversion? Is it about customer satisfaction? Or that combination? Maybe those are the two metrics you want. It's also about outcomes and not outputs. I think we have this conversation a lot as product people today. Uh, I think we need to keep having it for a while. But features, stories, bugs, lines of code, designs, whatever it is that we output are worthless if they don't actually achieve the outcome for the business or for the customer. And so outcomes are only meaningful, are meaningful to the business and they have to be measurable by the team. It's also really important to think about the fact that outcomes have an impact, right? It's not just about that company outcome. It's like, yes, we hit our goal, we increased conversion, we uh, increased retention, we, you know, we hit our milestones for the year. What does that actually mean for your customer, for your user? Uh, what impact are you having on them? How are you changing their lives or their work? Again, thinking back to that value chain of realizing the value that you're delivering for your customer and how that then ties back. So now that we've set all that up, it's really important to make sure that this is as coherent as possible and as clear as possible. And I think that's, again, where a lot of us fall short because we kind of set this vision up once, ha maybe have a big brainstorm an offsite, and we kind of announce it, we put it on a big wall at the offsite, and then we don't talk about it for a couple of years. And that means that it's not there influencing those decisions every single day. It's not helping us have that focus every single day. So just to kind of connect the dots and give you some examples here. So Alphabet, which is the parent of their corporate vision, uh, is to make the world around you universally accessible and useful. Again, big, hairy ass goal, really ambitious and audacious. But it makes sense, right? This is what they're trying to do. They're connecting the world. If you then dig into Google, their vision is related, right? It co comes back to that decision inception point. Google's vision is to make the world's information universally accessible and useful. Nest, which is, which is part of Alphabet, is to create a home that takes care of the people inside it and the world around it. YouTube is to give everyone a voice and to show them the world. So you can see how all of these visions connect into each other and connect into that bigger corporate vision. And if we drill down into Google a bit more, if we take that vision statement, one of their strategies is to Leverage an unrivaled store of data to better understand the content and serve the user with fast, accurate results. It's actionable, it gives an intent, it acknowledges the challenges in that. Some of the objectives and epics they might have done around that are things like improving crawl rate to capture more data, right? Because that helps you get that unrivaled store of data. Improving ranking algorithm to better understand the content so that you can give better results. Improve that speed of search. These are the kind of things that they might actually start building, hypothesizing, testing, right? And then at the bottom, they have uh, three core principles, actually, at Google about being fast, s accurate, and secret. So fast, obviously, all about the speed of those results, accuracy of results. But also, it's really important for them to be secret so that you can't unpick what the bl black box is doing and you can't game the SEO system. So you can see how like it, all of these um, points connect the dots back up to the vision uh, the principles are there to help make those decisions every single day. Is this going to make it faster? No. Nope. Okay, we're not doing it. Really easy, right? Don't have to have a meeting to make that prioritization call. I'm starting to wrap up here, but thinking about kind of who is involved in this process, I think is just as important. This is not a top-down thing. This is not the executive team going to a swanky offsite and coming back and going, here's the plan for the year. Go execute, right? It's all about an open, an open leadership. Strategy really is what leadership is all about, and I think the more that we can build autonomous cross-functional teams, the more time leadership actually has to spend on the strategic view, because we know that our teams are executing on what they need to execute on. As leaders, you have the overview, you have the insight, you have the experience to make those intuitive leaps 
and good strategy and to connect the dots across the business that individual teams might not be seeing. But the point is everybody owns that outcome, so you really can't do it behind closed doors. George Patton, a uh, famous World War II US general, said that if you tell people where to go, but not how to get there, you'll be amazed at the results. And it's all about giving that autonomy and intent to your team. One way to think about it is um, kind of getting that balancing act right. So in the, in the top stages, when you're setting up vision, mission, it is very much a leadership thing. It's in startups, it's very much the founder's job to kind of be setting this. The team's definitely still involved. They're in the room. They're part of those conversations. And then as you kind of move down the stack towards your strategy, towards your objectives, um, the team starts taking over more and more ownership of those things and more and more of the work going into writing it, creating it, sharing it. And eventually, at some point, leadership has to get out of the way, right? When you're down in that execution piece, it's not about micromanaging. The whole point of having the stack is so the team knows what they need to do and can execute on that. And that comes down to communication. So John Maeda at uh, the Singapore conference this year kind of made this great point that clarity is not just about transparency, but also understanding. And I think a lot of the time when we do these kind of exercises, we put up the big you know, vision statement, we put up the big strategy, and it's really transparent, everyone knows what it is, but does everyone really know what it means? Do we all have the sh same shared language that makes that understandable for us? Do we know what a, a certain metric means if we're not closely related to that metric? So it's really important to make sure that you're not just communicating it constantly, but checking in and making sure that people understand what, the, what those goals are and how they connect to them. So really, again, it's about over-communicating your vision and, and your strategy. You literally can't repeat these things enough. Every single all hands, you should be checking in and product, I kind of do a pop quiz and like ask people what the vision or mission is just to keep it top of mind, keep it fresh, make sure people are still thinking about those things. If you have offices, print them on the walls. Like these are the things that you want to be checking in on every day and want to be reminded about every single day. One example of this, and partly because I just love the word, uh, is a concept called Auftragsklärung, which is from the company Zing in Germany, which is the kind of German language version of LinkedIn. Don't worry, you don't have to figure out what that means. It's actually just mission clarity. And the way that they've done this is kind of taken this concept and boil it down to this, this one big sheet of paper that you see. It's a template that they've designed together. And it's not really for me what, about what's on the template. It's just that they have a template that they use. And this is setting out you know, the situation, the comp com complications of that situation, the intent they have, what are the boundaries, what are they trying to do, what are their outcomes, how are they going to measure it. And this template allows every single team to have a shared conversation about what they're doing. Well, what's your intent? Oh, well, this is it. They hang it up on the wall next to their team. Uh, they take it with them when they do company presentations. So they'll you know, take the giant sheet off the wall, go into the meeting room, and be like, this is where we are right now. And as you can see, they're kind of messy. Some handwritten notes, some post-it notes. You might you know, start sticking on wireframes or designs later on. Um, it's really just about having that shared clarity and also cross-company clarity. So anybody in the company can walk by and be like, oh, they're working on that. That's really cool. I have, I have some idea or uh, customer data or something that might help you with that. So wrapping up to some extent here around how often these things change. So the Agile Manifesto, as you hopefully know, says that we value responding to change over following a plan. So as much as these things sound like having a rock solid plan and you're just going to execute it for years, it's really about understanding where in the layer you do need to change. So your vision is more or less static, right? Microsoft, I think, took 20 years before they changed the vision statement. Like, that's a pretty big thing. It's a big goal. It should almost be unachievable. And you don't want to change it that often because it's going to confuse everyone in the company. Your strategy is probably something that's a three to five year timeline, right? Like, that's where are you going to go in the next three to five years? How are you going to tackle that problem? Objectives are probably annual or quarterly. Epics and things are always in constant flux. You're kind of reprioritizing based on new information all the time. You're figuring out. You're testing stuff with your clients. And principles are kind of the counterpoint to that. So they evolve somewhere in between. And it's really just a gut call uh, w between you and your team of, do we need to change a principle? We've changed our strategy. Does that mean that one of these principles doesn't make sense anymore? Is it not helping us make those decisions? 
as Jeff Bezos said, you really have to be stubborn on the vision. It just does not change, but really flexible on the details of how you're going to achieve that vision. And it's worth thinking about kind of how you have uh, designed a cadence of improvement in your company. So a lot of companies have this like, oh, we set up our 2019 plan, and then we measured our 2019 results, and well, we didn't hit our targets. Whoopsies. Um, most companies hopefully have quarterly reviews, so you're setting your OKRs on a quarterly basis, you're checking in on a quarterly basis. But think about, you know, how often can you actually do more progress checks, make, making sure that you are headed in the right direction. If you're doing Scrum and you're doing two-week sprints, is it worth checking in every, every sprint or two sprints to make sure that you're actually headed in the right direction, the direction you want to go? Because it's worth always asking ourselves, are we actually making progress towards our goals, or are we just building things for the sake of building things? What have we learned in these two weeks, four weeks, month that might change our strategy? Hopefully you're all out doing product discovery, you're talking to customers, you're talking to the clients every single day or every week at least. And you're gonna learn things, right? You're gonna realize that this, this great strategy that we had to go after this customer segment actually is meaningless. You don't wanna wait a quarter or a year to change your strategy based on that new information. You wanna be able to react to that as quickly as possible. And then again, on design principles, like what are the decisions that you keep making? What are the decisions that keep ending up in an escalation meeting or you know, having you have to call your boss to make that decision? Can you take that and make it a design principle or a product principle? So now that we have our great vision, a great strategy and a great execution, we kind of know what we need to build. We know why we want to build it and we know how we want to build it. So please go back to your teams and keep asking those questions. Ask how all the way down. If anyone comes to you with a vision, say, how are we going to achieve that vision? If they come to you with a strategy, how are we going to achieve that? Start getting them to break it down every step of the way. And do it the same way all the way up, right? If someone gives you a story or a task or something to build, ask why. Make sure that it is actually connecting all the way back up to your goals, your company goals, and your company vision, or you're not going to be headed in the right direction. So thank you very much. There's some book recommendations there um, that have really helped me understand more of this stuff around strategy, the art of action, what motivates people. Uh, Turn the Ship Around is a fantastic book about giving intent. It's about a US Navy submarine captain and how he kind of took over a failing ship and turned it around, uh, hence the name, uh, and really about giving intent. And he basically forbade himself for a year to actually give an order. The only orders that he kept were the order to fire a weapon and the order to submerge the ship. Everything else is like, I'm not making the decision. The team will make the decision. They have to come to me and present the options. And as long as they've checked the boxes, like that's their decision to make. So it's a fantastic book to really start understanding how to give that intent to your team and how to give that autonomy to your team. Thank you very much. All right, thanks very much, Martin. Um, just move over here so I'm yeah. in range <laughs> of the camera. Um, so we've had, uh, just a reminder, if you are submitting questions, sli.do, code hash L447, so if you'd like to submit some questions. Um, there are some questions that have come in um, so far, so Martin, if you're ready. Um, yep. I'm gonna, the, the most upvoted question I'm going to hold till the end, because it's a little, <laughs> little bit controversial, so we'll, we'll come back to that one. Um, and it's interesting <laughs> how when you're looking at the questions, you often see like they're, they're hinting at in interesting issues within their organisation. So I'll start with uh, the, the second highest uh, voted question, which is how do you align if the company has dual strategies that are causing conflict because of resource scarcity? So I think this is where uh, it's kind of a fundamental structural problem in the company, and I think it's really about uh, understanding that if you have those dependencies, they either have to be you know, chasing the same strategy or you have to kind of cut that dependency line so that they can have two different strategies. Because you're never going to be able to have that prioritization conversation, right? Because there are different owners for it. There's, um, you know, e each of those sounds really meaningful, sounds really useful, but uh, if they're kind of dependent on each other, you're never going to be able to prioritize between, you know, bugs or features or anything like that. You kind of have to carve out and carve out the dependencies. Did right. I escape the question? I, no, I think that I think that makes perfect sense. 
I think if you, if you move over a bit, I've actually got the Slater thing on there yes, now. Yes, sorry, too. let me... Uh, Come join me. Thank you. All right, that's better. <laughs> <laughs> Should I put the laptop over here? Because this is slightly awkward. Right, the next question is, um, what are some common themes or approaches you've seen in teams that are great at identifying the right problem to solve? For me, I think the, the number one heuristic is how often they're talking to customers. So it's one of the things I do um, on the side is I kind of advise startups all over Europe. I work as an EIR for a, a VC firm, and so I get to go into a lot of startups, especially at that kind of A or B round. Kind of the number one question, the first question I always ask is like, last week to a customer at every level, right? So both the CEO, the founders, uh, and anyone in product or design and engineering. And it's really telling, I think, how much that maps to their ability to correctly identify what they're doing for their customer. So you're not talking to your customer, how are you going to know? So I think the, the goal for me is always that it should be at least once a week that ideally everybody on the product team, so product design, engineering, in a, in a squad, is actually talking to customers. Even if it's on a video call or going out to customers or having customers come in, have two or three conversations a week, uh, and they can be about the next thing you're building, but in that broader context, you're also going to have a conversation to really understand what it is that makes your customer tick and what it is, you know, what they're struggling with. What, is, what are they trying to solve? Why are they using your product? And that really gives you that sense of like, okay, that's what we're solving for this customer. This is how we can do it better. This is actually the thing that the customer doesn't even understand is a, a hole in our product that we could fill and do better. Uh, and it, that all comes from talking to customer. Customer who knew that was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, oh, this is a good, good one actually. Um, how did you set vision for Product Tank, and what, it's, what are some examples of strategy changes that you made as it grew? So, some examples of how it works in the real world. So, I think Mind the Product definitely grew as a very haphazardly, like any startup, right? I think we were a hobby for the first five years of our existence, so until after our first SF conference, we were running as a hobby. We're all VPs of product at startups doing, doing the job by day. And so we were kind of, you know, not that focused on having a strategy. We weren't very cohesive or clear about it. And we were kind of just evolving very organically and following kind of, oh, the community wants to do this. Let's go do that. Um, and I think since then, we've been building up a company. We now have 16 full-time employees. So we've had to start going through this process, right, of figuring out how do we clarify this. Not just five founders hanging out in a pub anymore. Like, this is an actual company. We're paying people to do jobs. They want to do good jobs. We want to make it a great experience for them. How do we have a clear strategy that they understand and buy into? And I think originally, we probably did uh, over index. So I think our vision originally was much more about being the biggest community in the world, right? That's the thing you shouldn't be doing, right? Because it was very much focused on us and what we could do, what we could be. And so we've changed that recently. I think the strategy was much more about events because it's kind of how we had started. So with meetups and then conferences, and now we realize like we can't do all the events in the world. <coughs> this is probably the controversial question coming later on. <laughs> um, but at, you know, we want to support those as much as we can, but at the same time, it's also about content. So I think increasingly our strategy is going to be much more around content and also making sure how we share some of the great content that we get at all these meetups, right? So that's why you're seeing the live streaming kit. It wasn't necessarily meant to be used uh, by me the first time around, but the idea is to try and test, like, can we share these stories, not just between Wellington and Auckland, but also, you know, with the rest of the world, because all the great things happening in product are not coming out of the valley. They're coming from everywhere in the world, and that's really our mission, to share those stories and get that content out there. So I think that's a shift you're seeing now as well with new hires and everything that we're doing around that strategically. I think we'll be trying to share um, links to content from particularly locally. So there's quite a lot of good talks that are happening in Australia and obviously they're you know, close to our time zone. So we will be trying to share, share those links with everyone as well. All right, what have we got next up? Incidentally, if you join the Slido, you can also vote questions up and down as well. Don't do it too quickly because it confuses me when I'm trying <laughs> to read them. <laughs> uh, there's one from Tokes in Wellington. Um, how have you seen companies successfully articulate their strategy? Is it PowerPoints, documents, stories, smoke signals? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's probably all of the above except maybe smoke signals. But um, I think it, it goes back to that point about you can't repeat it often enough, right? So I think if it is definitely, it's a, it, there is a, it's a strong presentation somewhere that you, you know, a company executive or a leader or one of you would give to the rest of the team. 
but there is also a document, there's a story, there's probably something on the wall. I think there, it's getting all of those touch points. It's, it's like any communications channel. I think if we go and talk to our friends in marketing, they're gonna say like a brand campaign isn't just a TV ad, right? There's all the supporting things around it. The TV ad's a big story, um, but then there's things in print. There's um, you know, PR pieces that are you know, touch, touch points with the people behind that brand. All of those layers are kind of how you need to think about communicating something as important as your vision and strategy as well. Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, so talking about different roles in their, resp in their responsibility around strategy, so how do you see product marketer and product manager working together and splitting responsibilities and setting up and betting on strategies? Thanks, Ramana. So I, f I feel like um, one of those needs to kind of own the product in a sense so that you, again you don't it doesn't come down to a conflict between two people or competing um, objectives um, and at the same time as a team like whether the product marketer is part of a product team or the other way around it's really important that the whole team is trying to figure out what is the best way to do this and it is about having those conversations the awkward conversations around what our goals how are we actually going to achieve those what are the ways that we could try these things and you'll get great ideas from product marketing you'll get great ideas from product get great ideas from your designers and uh, engineers as well, put them all in the mix and figure out what, are, what is the most likely bet that you want to make to try and move in that direction, how can you test it, what is the MVP that you can do to you know, test that hypothesis. All of those little steps that we you know, we know we have in our toolkit, but probably don't use often enough. And I think one of the things to actually watch out for is to try and do a little bit too much of everything just because everyone thinks it's a good idea. So. If you have kind of conflicting ideas, you need to figure out how are, how are you going to test which one is better. And it's not necessarily just you know throw up an A-B test because that's kind of the lazy way out of like, well, let's, let the, let's build the thing and let the customer decide, right? That's kind of, there needs to be a better way to do that. Is there, is there a prototyping thing that you can do? Is there an MVP thing you can do? Is there something you can do even as a almost logical exercise as a team to figure out like what is the possible impact of that, right? Like the ability to achieve a 10% increase in conversion and a 10% increase in sales are very different things have very different impact. You're much less likely to be able to do a 10% improvement in conversion if you have a decent kind of e-commerce site in this example. But 10% increase in sales could be entirely possible, right? So I think it's really understanding um, some of those numbers that you're using and, and what you're trying to achieve can even help you as a team understand that that goal is just probably not realistic. So this is the more in interesting goal because it can actually help us hit the objectives that we want to do and therefore, let's go try that, right? Uh, what have we got next up? So next one from Stephen. Um, so you highlighted intuition being important. How do you create an environment where the ability to follow intuition can thrive? I think this is about um, cross-pollination and time, really. So I think it's, you know, we talk, I talk a lot about cross-functional autonomous teams. Hopefully, most of you are working in that direction. but. The danger of that, obviously, is you get very focused in on your goal, right? You own your one part of the product, you're just building on that, you're executing on that. Even if you're doing the, the best job in the world, talking to customers all the time, you're, you're hitting your numbers, you can kind of get a little, you know, soloed in on that, a little um, blinder, you know, blinders on, you kind of can't see other opportunities. So I think it's really important that as these teams is to kind of cross-pollinate, like what are we working on? What are the challenges we're facing? I think that's, again, where that outside kind of model kind of helps is like all the teams have a shared language about what they're working on and can have those conversations as you know, a group of product managers or as a group of designers and help each other see new ways and new paths and new approaches. I think it's also incredibly important to actually schedule in that time, right? To, to take time to reflect, to take time and think about are there other things that we could be looking at? Are there other opportunities we could be pursuing? And I think that's one of the hardest things to do as product people, as you all know, like we're super busy, long hours already, like how do you carve that time out? And I think this is where it's so important to kind of trust your team and, and build that autonomy in the team so that you don't have to be there and make all the little decisions every single day. Through this decision stack, hopefully they're actually clear enough that you all, you know, engineering doesn't even, doesn't even have to ask. They know that like this option is better than that option and they can just execute on that. Design knows that this option is better than that option. And that does actually help free up more time for all of you to get out there and talk to customers or to take that reflection time and, and figure out if there's a better way to achieve the, the outcome you want. Uh, well, here's a good question. So since, since you've been traveling around the region, um, 
Are you noticing any interesting or different trends in practices, or sorry, trends or practices in product management from Asia, or China, and India, et cetera? I think it's, it, the fascinating thing is actually that we, I think we have more similarities than we have differences. So when we go talk to the people, and I, it's probably to some extent a self-selecting crowd, right? The people who care enough about the craft to come to a product tank event like you guys are doing tonight. You care enough to be thinking about how can we do this better? How can I, how can I make this better at my company? So it's probably to some extent self-selecting, but I think we are um, more alike than we are different. We all face the same challenges. I think there are actual cultural organizational differences. So a lot of what we've seen in, in Southeast Asia, for example, is a hunger to do um, product the right way, which means that they you know, import almost experienced product leaders from the rest of the world. Uh, they can train up local um, graduates or more regional graduates or kind of you know, convert designers and engineers into product but that middle layer is kind of missing, so they don't have the senior product managers who can be player coaches. So I think there's kind of structural differences like that. Um, there's also obviously cultural challenges, as I'm sure you guys know even better than we do around communication things. I think as you're trying to start building this kind of autonomy and intent, that works really well in some cultures and is really, really hard in some cultures to kind of really feel like you can put your hand up and ask the boss a question or challenge why you're doing something. And that takes time to build, and that takes a lot of effort and trust from the leadership to actually build that culture uh, and make people realize that that is okay. And I guess just to reiterate the, what I said earlier on around actually getting out there and visiting, yeah. you know, as, as when you're on holiday, when you're traveling, you know, connect with these people and, uh, and have these kind of conversations. It was, it's, for me personally, it's been really heartening that I've had conversations with product leaders in different regions and... Um, well, heartening but disheartening because they, you know th there's no silver bullets yeah. out there. You know, they're all having the same struggles that we are. You know, it was it was great to, to do it, but it was you know interesting. That all the challenges we face down here at the end of the earth, they're the same in Hong Kong. They're the same in Singapore. They're the same in San Fran. As Martin said, context changes, scale changes, but the fundamental challenges yeah. are still there. Yeah, I really wish there was a silver bullet, but <laughs> it make our lives so much easier. But it is a craft, and it's one we have to work out. I think. This is, this is a good question. Um, who takes the ownership in defining the product vision in the company? And, uh, and I think what they're getting at here is, is it at the product level or is it at the executive level? Um, I think this is where uh, it, it gets a little trickier, right? So if you are a startup um, and you're, or even a one product company, I don't think there is a difference between company vision, company strategy, and, and product strategy and product vision, right? It is one and the same thing. That can be a really hard conversation to have with the founder or the CEO, that like you have to let go a little and, and, and involve the product person. Uh, and in, in those instances, a lot of what I do is actually help those startups, again, when they raise that A round or B round, are hiring their first product teams, the founder has to start letting go. And probably five or 10 years ago, you know, because I'd been doing the job, I was like, get the founder out of the room, like let me do my job. Um, but now I've actually seen it work better where Again, it's that kind of sliding scale thing of, you know, the founder and this or CEO, they are there for a reason, right? They had a vision, they had an idea, they executed on something. They've obviously gotten enough traction to get to a point where they're you now scaling the team. So you don't want to cut that out. They have a lot of context, they have a lot of information, they have a lot of insight, and they have those intuitive leaps. But as product leaders, we can help them with that conversation. So we definitely need to be in that room so that we can come up with a cohesive whole that actually figures out how to build a strategy around that vision and mission. And so th there, I think it's one and the same. I think at bigger companies where you have more than one product, where you have a portfolio approach, there is definitely then an executive or a, a company level strategy. But even then, it's not done in closed doors, right? It's, or behind closed doors. It's not done just in a leadership a meeting or offsite. It's, it should involve each of those teams to figure out like what's working for your product area, right? What is the product leader in that area seeing? What are the opportunities? What are the adjacencies that we could go after? And then that all informs the overall company and strategy. So it kind of forms more bottom up almost. And again, that's where executive leadership's role is really about seeing those connections, right? So what are the things that the two different product teams, oh, they're both trying to go into the US. Well, let's make that a company strategy and, and support them by building the office and doing the things at the company level that you can do to do that. Um, uh, so yeah, I think it's, it's understanding those different layers, but Really, I see less and less difference between a, a product strategy and a company strategy. I think the, the, other, the only difference now really is product strategy is what you're actually going to build. And then the company strategy also needs to include, okay, how are you going to market it? How are you going to sell it? What is, what is the, you know, those pieces? And how are you going to build the organization around that? 
but the the core piece should still be the product side of the event. Right, okay, so we're just coming up on seven o'clock, so we'll take a couple more questions. Um, oh, this, this one was asked fairly early on, um, and it's a very good question. Um, how is it that bad visions are so pervasive, and what can we do as product leaders to help inspire good ones? I think it's, it, go Google how to write a vision, right? And you're gonna get all of those cookie cutter <laughs> templates. And it's really easy, right? It's really tempting, you're like, oh shit, I have this like offsite in two days, I have to like come up with this, let's, let's use the template, we can use that as like the exercise that we're gonna use. <laughs> so it becomes really easy to kind of fall into that trap. And I think that's why we have so many bad ones, right? And I think, you know, we went, I think massively in the wrong direction thinking about like, how big can mine the product be? And like, that wasn't the point of what we're trying to do. And as a team, when we got together to really think about what is like, why are we here? Why do we get excited about working here and doing what we do with Mind the Product? It became clear that it was all about the community, right? It was about the people that we work with, the product community that we're trying to help. So it was very easy for us to really come up with a vision that was and a mission statement that was much more about that. So I think it's as product leaders, what we can do is make sure to throw away all of those terrible templates and make sure they don't get used in all sites. Um, but then come with those questions about, you know, what, how is this different? What, how, how do we differentiate ourselves to anyone else? What is the customer problem that we're solving? And if you keep coming back to those kind of things, then you're going to be able to come up with a much more cohesive and clear vision. I guess just to add to that as well, you know, you guys and girls can all support each other. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes it, this involves tough conversations with execs when you look at a, a company strategy and go, oh, my God, that, you know, just fitted into Martin's yeah. list of terrible, <laughs> terrible strategies. Um, you know, have a conversation with someone else in Product Tank. You yeah. use the Slack channels, connect with each other and, and talk about, you know, hey, I've seen this. Help me with some tips on, you know, persuading my CEO that they need to throw away the terrible vision yeah. <laughs> and start over. Yeah. Um, yeah, support each other as a community. Definitely. All right, we'll do one last question here. Um, well, this, is a, this looks like a really good one. Um, in large organizations, if the clarity from up top is missing, how risky is local optimization? If I set a vision for my space, so I, uh, sorry, if, if I set a vision for my space, so I run the risk of low stability. <laughs> I think this is where, again, it's it's worth thinking about how not to get, you know, how not to put your fingers on and just focus on your area. So I, I, it can be incredibly frustrating. Like I've worked in big organizations as well where you don't feel like you have the clarity from up high. And I think there, there's two strategies in my head, right? One is to keep asking the questions and like try to get that clarity up, even if it's frustrating and you feel like you're running into a brick wall every single week. Um, but then also work with your peers, right? Find the other heads of product directors, you, you know, whatever, whatever your peers are that have their product areas and kind of start building your own clarity around that. Even if it's just a shared session of talking to each other about what you're focused on and what your goals are so that you don't end up kind of um, siloing and you don't end up, uh, you know, conflicting with each other and you don't end up kind of running in different directions either. So either work with your peers or kind of keep convincing upwards or do both. I think it's, it, again, the most important thing that we do as product people is communicate, right? And that has to be with our peers as much as with our teams and with our, our leadership. So it's, there's no easy answer again, a silver bullet, but I think that those are the two things to kind of keep to keep plugging away at. Uh, and we're maybe thinking, you know, much more tactically with something like Avatar's clearing as a model, what are the things that you can do to help achieve clarity at your level, right? Like even if it's just with your peers, right? In your product team, your designers and, and engineers and then see if you can get the rest of the company to adopt that in a bottom-up approach but then challenges leadership to make sure they are asking those questions and are clarifying and stipulating kind of what that vision and mission and strategy should be right all right okay now there is uh, sorry so well one question before we can we get to the um the, the really hard one um firstly are you able to share the slides yeah so there's an older version of this live already i'm, I'm gonna uh, i'm gonna upload these in the next couple of days okay. so they will be all live yeah. we'll post that link on the yeah. on the meetup page right now the last on, question on that before you jump onto that one <laughs> do do reach out uh bfg martin on twitter find me on linkedin uh i'm still kind of testing this concept i'm a product person so i'm putting out a hypothesis and testing how it re resonates with people so i would love to get feedback on this if there are bits that made sense bits that didn't make sense what could be clearer uh, so that i can keep evolving this content Right, and the last question, <laughs> and I will help you answer this one. Um, what are the chances of Mind the Product bringing their conference to New Zealand or Australia in the next 12 months? 
Well, given that's the next 12 months, thank you for time bounding that question. <laughs> I can kind of categorically say it's a no because we're already planning 2021 dates. Annalise is doing contracts for and discussing dates for 2022 at this point. That's how long those lead times are. So that was a really easy answer. Um, <laughs> I think realistically, though, again, what we've realized in building the events that we have and, and trying smaller events uh, in Hamburg and Manchester is that the kind of event that we want to be able to run doesn't work at that scale. And they, those simply, they're a lot of fun, but they simply don't work as businesses. They are literally loss making. So we can't kind of keep, you know, we can't keep adding more of those. We're, we're getting them to the point where they're at least break even and maybe and then let them keep running. But that's, that's why we kind of stopped trying to figure out other smaller things. And I think where we really have that strength is being the kind of the big regional conference and really attracting people from all over the world to those conferences. So London, we had people from 52 countries in October. In San Francisco, we had people from 36, 34 states across the US. Uh, in Singapore, we had people from 26 countries around the region. And as I joked on stage in Singapore, New Zealand was both the farthest east and the farthest south. You guys really are far away from everything. Um, but you know, we had people from Taipei, from uh, from India, from all over Australia, New Zealand, all over Southeast Asia, from China. So like that, that's the strength of that conference, I think, is really bringing people together at that international scale. And I think we're excited to figure out like how we can help you guys do something more local, more regional, without necessarily having us do the work because we can't do it, and she will kill one of us. <laughs> So, so, so to add to that, um, for those who aren't aware, um, the Product Tank Auckland team have been talking with Minor Product for probably over 12 months now about the concept of running a conference um, in New Zealand, um, in Auckland. We'd really love to have one here. Um, and we did our MVP, so we have had our MVP conference already. We did the unconference um, around about a month or so, two, two months ago. We really enjoyed it. We had massively great feedback from everyone. Um, thank you so much to everyone who came along, and I ho you know, hope hope you guys also enjoyed it in the same way that we did. Um, we will definitely be doing it again, um, and hopefully on a slightly larger scale. So we're sort of you know, going from our MVP to our next iteration beyond the MVP. That does actually exist, for those of you who just do the MVP yeah. and then <laughs> stop there. Um, so we do intend to, to kind of step that up a bit. And kind of that's, I think, you know, Martin and myself and, and Tokes and Wellington, we're going to have a bit of a sit down tomorrow and talk about this amongst other things. But I mean, I think what we'll see ourselves doing is trying, what can we do locally? What can we do in Auckland? Because you know we are down the end of a very, 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 very long pipe uh, from these guys and, and the rest of the world. You know, um, so you know we will try and do something organically in Auckland um, and on, you know, building on the base of what we started with the the unconference, um, you know, eight or so weeks ago. Um, so that's that's kind of the, the short answer from me. Um, we do want to engage the region as well. So you know, Wellington team, we really would like you to you know to, to make this the kind of event that you would see yourself travelling to Auckland for, and also for people watching from other areas. You know, we, we'd love to get people out of Australia coming down to New Zealand for that as well, and build something that's worth people spending the money on the airfare. So that's that's kind of our vision here at Product Tank Auckland. Is it too ambitious? Uh, my my team around the world, uh, so in front of me here, are kind of looking <laughs> slightly nervous. <so. laughs> Um, but that's what we'd really like to do. Um, but a plug for um, the Mind the Product conferences. The Singapore conference is precisely two hours closer by plane than, <laughs> than, the, than the, the last closest one, which was San Francisco. So it's yeah. a little bit closer. A little bit closer. San Francisco. Uh, so Singapore is a fabulous place to visit as well. I highly recommend it. We had a great time there. And, and, it, and the Mind the Product conferences, um, if there's one thing that Mind the Product does really well, and we try to echo this in New Zealand, it's quality. These conferences are high quality. Everything about them is, you know, just runs really well. I mean, I'm sure you guys are all running around like crazy things in the background. They are really, really worth going to. They're amazing at curating fantastic speakers from around the world. I do highly recommend it. It is well worth the money. Um, as I think as we said earlier in the year, if you are looking to make justifications to your employers around traveling to them, come have a chat with one of the organizers um, and we can help you with that. You know, a lot of us have been to them already. Um, the next one is coming up in Singapore in... March 30, 31st. March 30, 31st. Um, so not too far away. Get those get those justifications now. Get those budgets sorted out now. Um, it, is, it is well worth doing. But also, as I said, you know, watch out for what's happening in Auckland next. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, that's 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 the, the best accolade we can get, right? So I think that, that's why we keep doing what we do. But I think the 
Yeah, the thing you think about with the conference, as you said, was like if you are traveling in the region anyway, just think about how can you overlap a business trip with like another couple of days, whether it's San Francisco or Singapore, so that you can meet that rest of the community. And I think again, just as you guys hopefully get a lot of value out of this, I love coming and meeting meetups, meetup communities. Uh, you get a ton of value out of meeting other people who are peers uh, from very different cultures, very different backgrounds, doing different things. All of us are trying to figure out how to do this better. None of us have that silver bullet, but we care and we want to do better better work, so that's why we get together to talk about it. Thank you very much, Brad. Cool. Thank you, guys. Um, just, just a couple of uh, quick other shout-outs um, before we break. Um, huge thanks to Pushpay for hosting us. Thank you, Audrey, for organizing that. We love, we love coming here. Thank you so much for organizing the food. Round of applause for the Pushpay and the Pushpay team. <laughs> Um, and also thanks to the Product Tank Auckland organising team. Can you guys and girls put up your hands, please? So you, it's quite a base. Basically, I think I think we've got our whole team here tonight, actually. Um, so if you've got questions about Product Tank Auckland, have a chat with uh, one of the people that put up their hands or myself. Um, thank you so much for helping out with tonight. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming out. Um, I think there's a little bit of pizza left, Audrey. I don't know, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think we've got the space till 8 o'clock, I believe. Yes, so, so there's a bit more time. If you have, sorry, we couldn't get through all the questions. If you would like to ask more questions, do feel free to come and have a chat with Martin. Um, for the team in Wellington, um, you, know, you guys are welcome. Please join the Mind the Product Slack community. Um, I'll get out of the way of, oh, there we go, Martin's uh, Twitter handle there. But, you know, post the questions on Twitter. Um, yeah, Martin will happily, happily engage and volunteering you. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Big, big friendly giant. It's the easy way to remember. Yeah. <laughs> now, now that you see me in person, you understand why. Emphasis on the friendly part. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for coming.